All right, so my name is James Helfrich, and I teach software engineering at BYU-Idaho. I teach my students, I focus on how to make my students more employable, to be better programmers, which is actually a lie, because I want them to be better software developers. And there's an important difference between a programmer and a software developer. A programmer writes code, but a software developer consistently makes high quality software decisions. And that begs the question, what makes for a good software decision? If you're faced with two different designs, how do you know which one to choose? And that brings us to the notion of metrics. A metrics is ability to distinguish a good design from a bad one. And so I need to find what the best metrics are for a certain level of design. In this particular paper, we're talking about metrics for class designs. But I also want to be able to use metrics to help the students have more predictable grading. I want them to be able to say, to be able to self-assess and say, yes, I understand why I didn't meet the bar, or I want to be able to predict what my grade is going to be. Okay? So you can't control what you cannot measure. Okay, so I did some research and tried to discover what the current metrics are in the literature about uh, class design, about object-oriented design. And there is a plethora of them. And the question is, well, which one of these actually is the right one, or what combination, or which ones don't really inform you, or what distinguishes a good design from a bad one? And so how can I tell which of these metrics is the best ones and which ones are not? Well, I need to come up with metametrics. And a metametric is something to evaluate the quality of a metric. Now, I think it's really important for you to be able to take something away, no matter what discipline you have. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about metametrics and how it applies to your everyday decision making. Okay? So whether you're trying to decide what grade to assign to a student, what kind of car to buy, what restaurant you should go to, who you should marry, all these things are based on metrics. You have a couple different options and which one is the best and how are you going to decide. First and foremost, your metrics must be valid. Okay? You must measure the right thing. And if you accomplish that, the next thing you want to do is have something that's reliable. There's a small amount of error in your measurement. And if you achieve that, the next thing you want to do is efficient. You want to have the smallest amount of effort required to obtain that measure. Now, let me share with you the importance of these three different metrics. Let's say, for an example, I was a track coach and I wanted to figure out who was going to participate in 100 meter dash. Well, I'm going to pick someone who has red shoes because last year the person who won had red, red shoes. Now, is that efficient? Yes, I can pick red shoes out very quickly. Is it reliable? I'm very good at finding the color red. But is it valid? No. It has nothing to do with how fast someone runs. So if a metric is invalid, nothing else matters. It is the single most important thing. So we must find metrics that are valid. All right, so now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure, I'm going to take a whole bunch of students from the, uh, I'm a high school track coach, from the cafeteria and make them run 100 meters right away. Okay, is that valid? Yes, I'm measuring how fast they're running, but is it reliable? Well, no, some are gonna be wearing the wrong shoes, some just ate, some are sick that day. And is it efficient? Sure, it won't take, very, may take me very long. Okay, so now I found something that's valid and reliable, valid but not very reliable. So I'm gonna try again, okay. I'm gonna have them measure, I'm gonna measure them three times a day, morning, noon, and night, two weeks. And based on this, then I could run some statistical analysis to see who's the better runner. Is it valid? Yes. Is it reliable? Yes. Is it efficient? Not so much. It's going to require a lot of effort to get that. So we want our measurements to be valid, reliable, and efficient if possible. But most importantly, validity is number one. However, in the educational context, we also want to have instructive. We want to make an obvious path for someone to improve their performance. Okay? If I'm trying to figure out which restaurant to go to, it has to be valid. Yes, I care about the food. Reliable, I should be able to make it, make it predictably. And efficient, it shouldn't take me very long, but I don't really care so much about the instructive part. That's specific to the education domain. So going back to those metrics that I showed you previously, the problem is that none of them were valid. Counting the number of lines of code in a program is not going to tell you the quality of the design. Tell me the number of public interfaces and it's going to tell you the quality of the design. None of these align with what the literature says makes for a good class design. So we need to come up with a new set of metrics. So what exactly does that look like? Well, I went back and found out the three components of a class design. There is the public methods, there is the attributes, and there is the access specifiers. Those are the only three things. So I went through the literature. I'm talking about uh, the published literature. I'm talking about books, people written, speeches, and influential people have given tons and tons and tons of sources. 
to find out what people have to say about this. And from these, we come up with three new metrics for class design. The first one is convenience. Convenience is the degree in which the properties are presented to the clients in a format which facilitates the use in their application. In other words, the class is meant to, dis meant to serve the rest of the program. Okay, so we have a, a collection of different um, levels of convenience. Prohibitive means that I'm not really helped at all. In fact, it's, it's the absolute opposite. And seamless means it's so easy to integrate my new design into the overall application that um, it's easy to use. Now, the question is, is this valid? And the answer is, well, yes, this does align with what the literature says and makes for a good class design. Is it reliable? Ooh, careful here. We have a degree of subjectivity, don't we? Convenience is a personal matter from the perspective of the person who's using the class. But isn't that exactly the thing that we're trying to measure, right? In other words, we cannot increase reliability without taking a hit on validity. And taking a hit on validity is unacceptable, okay? The next one is fidelity, and then that's the suitability of a class in representing a design concern, okay? This is very similar to cohesion we had for functions. For, fu uh, for cohesion for a function, it was a function that's one thing and one thing only. But for a class, it needs to represent one thing and one thing and only. In other words, it's, a, it's about the nouns, it's not about the verbs, okay? And just like cohesion, we have very similar levels of quality. We have complete, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the design concern and my attribute selection versus poor, which means I done a really poor job with it. I'm afraid to say it. And the last metric we have is abstraction. The amount the client needs to know about the implementation details to use it effectively. In other words, are we shielding the client from having to know about my implementation details? Are we giving me, the programmer, the freedom to be able to innovate on the implementation without impacting the client's functionality in any capacity? And obviously, abstraction is a desirable attribute. And so complete means there is no way, and I need to do air quotes for that, there is no way that the client will ever know about my implementation details, the way that I choose to, to um, implement my attributes or my private methods. Or if it's critical, and critical is the worst case, in which the client has to know every single little detail in order to use my class effectively. Now, the nice thing about these three metrics is that for, uh, when you point out uh, a problem where they leaked an abstraction or their fidelity is not complete, then the path for them to increase their performance or the quality of the design is obvious, okay? But perhaps the most important thing for us as educators is this, we can drop these conveniently into a rubric which is gonna facilitate rating and so we can predictably um, and efficiently uh, provide a high quality grade to the student. And if we also teach them about convenience, fidelity, and abstraction, then they can self-grade and they can improve their own performance because believe it or not, you're not gonna always be there to grade their designs. And of course, when they graduate, they need to be able to evaluate their own design. So having them own the, the rubric is critical. My last slide is this. Um, is this enough? Is this enough to discern uh, design quality? And the answer is absolutely not. We have efficiency, algorithmic efficiency, and we have maintainability, which is all, and robustness, and all these are about all levels of design. We have cohesion and coupling, and these this work with function quality design, right? And now we have these new metrics of convenience, fidelity, and abstraction with working class designs. But is that the end? Well, no, there's not. What's the quality of when you assemble classes together using inheritance, composition, aggregation, and association? And that's where alignment, adaptability, and redundancy come in, okay? And this whole thing is supposed to be a seamless suite of metrics which the students can, can learn so they can design better classes, okay? And I am early. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> Some questions. So, thanks uh, for uh, your presentation on uh, measurement of class design quality. So, this is the time to ask questions. Yeah, uh, so how does this approach uh, align or uh, uh, achieve all kind of different fields, different disciplines, or or whatever it's like? 
let's say on software developer and developer right. this I think that the generality of the, the generality of your system, how general it is to, That's right. to That's cover right. all disciplines. Yeah, so these these three specific metrics are only related to encapsulation design. In other words, working with a single class. Now it doesn't matter which language you're doing, this is completely language independent. It doesn't matter the application in which you're developing. If you're designing a class, then you care about it being convenient for the other users of the program, you know, sorry, the other developers in the program, and it represents the design concern completely, which is fidelity, and that you hide implementation details from the rest of the program abstraction, and those are general principles. And there's a large amount of research, um, in a, a lot of amount of writing in this, on the subject of class design to support that this is what classes should be. Thank you. So, any yes, other sir. You said that convenience is a very important thing. Uh, and yes, how is it going to teach your students to not mark themselves as C plus for convenience? Oh, that's, that's a good question. I do encourage students to self evaluate, and I evaluate them as well. And if we come up with a different level on the rubric, then we need to talk. Right? And that's absolutely a conversation I want to have because if their self-evaluation is in inaccurate, I need to help them to correct that so they can move forward. But yeah, this is something that um, we go through. In, in my class, we go through lots of different examples about um, good and bad convenience, good and bad fidelity, and different strategies we can use to apply it. My goal is to arm them with a toolbox. It's not a toolbox, that's like a holster, but run with me on this, right? A toolbox of different uh, tools they can use so they can whip it out at the right time in the right place. Okay, thank you. So that's another question. Here. Yeah. How do we do the evaluation of the teachers in this case? How do the students uh, do, like say, if I'm teaching my evaluation, and how do I make sure that we are aligned? Okay, I believe your question is, if I have more than one teacher teaching the, the same section, how can we get inner rate of reliability? Is that correct? My question was slightly different. It's uh, like, yeah, if uh, I'm your student, yeah. I'm doing your evaluation, right. and you are doing your own evaluation, uh, and if we have a gap, yes, then yes. how do we achieve an alignment? Right, now mm -hmm. hopefully, if the student achieve, if the student, um, the student's work is anything but the highest level, of convenience, abstraction, or fidelity, then there is a defect involved, right? And it's my job as the instructor to point out their abstraction leak, or point out that there is a state that the problem domain has, but their code does not have. For an example, let's say that I was going to write a class to represent the time of day, right? So I'm gonna count the number of milliseconds since January 1st, 1970. Does this sound familiar to you? Right? Well, what's gonna happen in 2026? We're gonna run out of milliseconds. We're gonna wrap. We have a fidelity problem, right? And so it's my job as the instructor to point out that case they did not anticipate, and then they can see objectively that their representation was not robust enough to handle all possible time units. Okay. 